We will today continue in our study of the, the Proverbs, the wisdom of Solomon. Before we begin, let, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it is indeed good to be your children and to gather as your church to study your word, to bring our worship before you today, to praise you for all your goodness and all that you have done through Jesus, your son. So we pray that all that we offer you today in worship and in song and prayers is a sweet savor to you. We pray as well, Father, in, in thanksgiving for those who are returning to their health, for James who is improving, and for our brother Hubie as he's recovering from surgery. We're so grateful that he's home. Look forward to be gathered together with him. For others who are still struggling with sickness and those who are sheltering in place, we pray, Father, that they are strengthened as well as, as they continue to worship from home and as we hope to be gathered together with them. Soon, Father, we pray for your keeping and, and strengthening them in their faith. Our family is in spiritual need, and, and we know, Father, that you're aware of those. We pray today, especially for Jake Coster and his entire family and his grandparents and, and that entire situation as has been requested. We pray for their strength and for their healing, for their reconciliation. Especially we pray, Father, that you are glorified in all things. And as we study today, let us ever be mindful that we are setting ourselves to to learn the very thoughts that you have given us, the thoughts that shape our lives to, to be what you would have us to be. And we pray, Father, that we're ever more zealous to do so. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. When people talk about studying Proverbs, perhaps one of the two proverbs that come to people's mind is the one about training up the child in the way that they ought to go. And the other one a lot of men probably think about is the one that it would be better to sit on the corner of the rooftop than inside the house with a particular kind of wife. <laughs> we are today going to, to begin that topic of what Solomon has discerned about marriage, about the relationship of husbands and wives, and the relationship of parents and child, and, and that whole manner of discipline and training, and what is a good husband, and what is a good wife. Some of those verses that seem to be so slanted toward the wife, and without saying too much about the husband, you have to recall when this was written, in a time when the norm was patriarchal and you have to remember that Solomon is a king writing to his own son and so yeah it has that angle but let's recall in the New Testament when Peter and Paul are talking about husbands and wives and he's talking about what a godly woman is he then says in the same way husbands also the Apostle Paul does it well. He says, and husbands also. So this, this bias in the Old Testament it does not exist in the New or ought not exist in the New. So Solomon has a lot to say about the, 
the nuclear family, when he finally realized the, the blessing in that. And he began by having a lot to say about two adults being joined together. One, one husband, one wife, monogamy is God's plan and it's the best plan. There is no reference, no recommendation of polygamy and certainly if Solomon had tried that, hadn't he, Jeff? From a man who had had several hundred wives and concubines, he finally saw past that. You know, he was one who in his youth was like a lot of people, typically in their youth. If it's good, you want more and more of it. Or if you think it's good, you want more and more of it. But then he came to understand the blessings of having only one wife. And in the, in the nuclear family, there is a great blessing of that husband and wife speaking in one voice in, in the raising of the children. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 8. So many of these Proverbs, when he's writing directly to his son, he begins this way. Chapter 1, verse 8, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Where, who, on who is the emphasis for teaching or instruction? Here, here you're, the, the Father. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. There it's the Father who has the responsibility to teach. In Ephesians 6 and verse 4 and verse 6, there the emphasis is on the Father's teaching. Solomon talks about the father's instruction and the woman's teaching. The father sets forth the standard, the principle, and the mother comes behind it and, and sees that it's fulfilled, that it's, and in fact, you know, here's the standard. This is the, what's going to be the standard of this family. And the mother, through her teaching, through her example, fleshes it out, and, and that's the way the family is going to live. The, it, it places the obligation on the father. And then in full agreement, the mother's teaching. One, again, one instructs in principle, the other upholds in practice. In Proverbs 6 and verse 20, we see the same. Proverbs 6 and verse 20, again, he begins saying, my son, Observe the commandment of your father and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. You might say, well, the, the commandment is from the father and the family and the statutes and the ordinances and all that's the practice of come by the mother's teaching. Solomon, in all of that, though, is, is, is teaching the value of one husband, one wife. Now, yeah, why well, men think about what the woman should be like. He, he does say what the man should be like as well. Proverbs chapter 5, verse eight, 18 and 19. In encouraging this monogamous situation. Well, I'm going to start in verse 15. Drink water from your own cistern and fresh water from your own well. Should your springs be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets? Let them be yours alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. As a loving hind and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. He's writing to a young man who, he's the prince of, he could, like his father, have anybody and have everybody, you would think. And he certainly, if he's like his father, would probably want a whole bunch of wives. But he's saying, let your fountain be blessed by, by finding satisfaction only in one wife. As in your youth, let her satisfy you. Not by giving yourself to some strange woman. 
in the relationship, the wife is giving to you, but in adultery, the man is giving to somebody else and really bankrupting the marriage. Isn't it? If it, ideally you're give, both are giving to the other, but one's giving to somebody else, that's a bankrupt situation. It, the, the husband is to be more than loyal, we see in that passage. He really is to be in love, in the way that Solomon uses the word love. To, to find the woman lovely and to find her ways lovable. The, but to, as he describes, but to give yourself to a strange woman, another woman, that, that, that's a broken vow, not only against the marriage partner, but against God. Proverbs 2 and verse 17. Why are we talking about this? Most of us are of the age, we're not out chasing other people and wanting more husbands and more wives and all that. Well, there still is a responsibility to teach those younger than us. Teach our children. Most of us have an opportunity still to, to affect the lives of our grandchildren. We're going to go to chapter 2 and verse 17. I'm going to pick up in verse 16 again. To deliver you from that strange woman. In other words, come out of that. That which is really bankrupting the marriage. To deliver you from the strange woman, from the adulteress who flatters with her words, that leaves the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. That's the problem. It is a covenant made with God. Uh huh. Um, you know, I was talking to my granddaughter with Elaine because she's nine. I had her for a couple of days. But anyway, this is last week, and we were talking about sex before marriage and marriage and all that, you know, being right with God. And I told her, I said, you know, if you're only with one person, then you never have anybody to compare it to. So if you've had several relationships, you know, you're, you can compare that person to other people, and that's not a healthy thing to do. You How know? do you devote yourself totally to the one if you've known many? Really hard to do. Part of your soul is fractured. It's exactly. Not part, of, you know, part of yourself. There's several things that are fractured. You've, you've bankrupted the wealth, the fullness of the wealth of the relationship. You break the covenant we see here. You break the covenant with God. We're going to see you also corrupt the spirit that is within you. I mean, everything about it, was it you'd ever use the word fractured? Everything about it's fractured. It's, the, the plan is God's and the covenant is before God. It is a sin, yes, against the spouse. It is a sin against God. It's also a great harm to oneself. Look at Malachi chapter 2. Verses 14 through 16. Last book of the Old Testament, Lyle. Malachi 2, verse 14 through 16. Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, Though she is your companion and your wife by covenant, but no one has done so who has a remnant of the Spirit. What's he saying? What? Is it verse 16? Malachi 2, beginning in verse 14. <laughs> verse 15, but no one who has done so who has a remnant of the Spirit. What's he saying? Are you really of the Spirit if you're practicing this kind of treachery? And what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? Take heed then to your spirit 
And let, let, let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord God of the God of Israel. And him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. Twice there, he says it very quickly. What's the problem? It's a bankrupt relationship. It's a broken covenant with God. And it is a to bar Deborah's word, a fractured spirit. There's nothing whole, there's nothing good to come of it. The Israelites, you recall, they wanted to be like all the other nations around them, didn't they? They wanted to have a king so they could be like uh, the other nation. The Israelite men also wanted to be like the other nations. The concerning marriage, they wanted to treat their wives like property. Solomon had done so. He treated wives and concubines just like stables of thousands of horses. But he finally came to learn that wives are not property. They're partners. Wives are not property. They're partners. And so in that way, the wife can make or break the husband. She can make or break it. Proverbs 18, verse 22. Solomon is in a verse 22. Solomon is upholding the, the benefits of one marriage, one man, one woman. Proverbs 18, verse 22. He who finds a wife, singular, finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. There's the benefit. Favored by the Lord because he's following the Lord's plan. He's doing what God has established by covenant that man should do. And so certainly whenever we do what God has planned, we find favor in that. Dis we find favor, well, despite even the, the obvious, do we call them dangers or even the obvious problems? Here's the one that many folks remember, Proverbs 21 and verse 9. Proverbs 21, verse 9. It is better, so somebody's making a value judgment here. It is better to live in a corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Now, I'm, again, I'm going to remind us what Peter said, and it, it's... Peter says, when he's talking about the character of a woman, and he says, and husbands also. And Paul says, husbands, and in the same way, 1 Corinthians, husbands likewise, 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 3. But <laughs> there are some days you might want to be on the corner of the roof than with me. I know. See, <laughs> that's a godly woman. She, I gave her an opportunity, and she didn't take it. <laughs> she has a tree house and a greenhouse and a little shed out in the front yard and she hmm. <laughs> yes uh, <laughs> but again it's written from this ancient perspective well there's a lot of benefits in Proverbs 19 and verse 14 Proverbs 19 and verse 14 it again is about what you value, really. Proverbs 19, verse 14. House and wealth are an inheritance from fathers. Well, that's all good. If you get a house and inheritance and wealth from your father, that's... But what's more valuable, a prudent wife is from the Lord. A prudent wife is a gift from God. And so he certainly saying the wife should be chosen carefully and God ought to be praised for that good wife because again she can either break or make the man she has a lot to to do to either honor or degrade the the status of the man again in in God's plan 
Uh huh. What she said is exactly what, look at Proverbs 12 and verse 4. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband. What has she just done? She's crowned him. She says, this is the finest man she's ever known. I know him. He's quite a special man. Would she have that sense if she had been had many husbands? Would she even be able to recognize that? Would she even value that? Perhaps not. But she who shames him is like rottenness to his bones. We who shame anybody else is rottenness. To, to their bones. But again, the wife can make or break her husband. So she compliments the, the status of the man. She is, as a helper, enabling him to succeed. On the other hand, by criticism, she can sap him of his strength, of his energy. She might keep him from doing his best. It particularly, in in a culture that, that Jewish culture, I mean, everything was about the lineage of the father to the son, to the son, to the son. And the, the, the father, uh, the, the patriarch of the family was, was everything. And then to, to disgrace his reputation, it, it really is like, it says a rottenness to the bones. It really is like an infection to the body. Like a, like a cancer to the body. It, it's going to require some healing. Well, regarding the, mess, the, the marriage, we rightly understand between us and God that sin is a sin is a sin. And any sin separates us from God. But Solomon speaks of sexual immorality as a most terrible kind of sin. He, he says it, it's, it's worse in this way because it's so illogical. Look at Proverbs 5, verse 19 and 20. And when you think about God's design from the beginning, anything else apart from that, is just so illogical. Proverbs 19, 5 and verse 19. We were here earlier. As a loving hind and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. For why should you, my son, be exhilarated with an adulteress and embrace the bosom of a foreigner? That's illogical. That word exhilarated there is the same word that is translated intoxicated. When you're intoxicated, you, you, you don't think as you do normally, do you? Well, there's a time when it's good to be intoxicated. When, it, when a, a husband is, is with his wife, and with her own, and in the uniqueness of that relationship. That's intoxicating. There's times where, yeah, 
It's like being out of your mind. And that's good. But to, to have that with somebody else, he says, that's, that's just not logical. It, it's not. But you don't have that with somebody else because if you don't just, it, it's more of a flesh thing. Yeah. It's not that intoxicating. Well, it's there's like there's two kinds of intoxication. There's lust of the flesh. Yeah. A lot of people make a lot of bad decisions with that. And that's a kind of intoxication. But it's not but, that intimacy. But there's that good kind as yeah. well. Yeah, Jeff. You know, a lot of times this puts this into the physical. It says don't, uh, don't be captivated by the adulterers. You look at that as the physical, but when you look at today's world, and I'm sure they've had it then too in a different way, but you look at today's world with TV, computer, internet, the pornography, all that. What they do is get in your mind and make you think like you would do with adults. I mean, you know, physically we'd say, well, I've never been with another woman. But if our mind is going somewhere else with a commercial, uh, something on the internet, magazines, what you see downtown on Main Street, that's that's the same thing. Your, your mind is not being true to one because your mind is going off. Whoa, look at that. It is so much a part of our culture. Years ago, Dean and I stopped eating at Carl's Jr. because their way of advertising hamburger was to have Paris Hilton soaked up on the hood of a Rolls Royce and slamming around. You know, it's, but hey, the question there in, in Proverbs 5 verse 9, why would you do that? Why would you do those other things we've already talked about? Bankrupt the relationship. Why would you do something so harmful to your own spirit? It just doesn't make sense. For in Proverbs 6 and verse 20, or Proverbs 6 and verse 33, it doesn't make sense because it is so dishonorable. Proverbs 6 verse 32, we'll start. The one who commits adultery with a woman is lacking sense. He's lacking sense because he's of this intoxication of lust of the eye. He would destroy him. He who would destroy himself does it. Wounds and disgrace he will find. And his reproach will not be blotted out. It's, it's always going to be remembered, isn't it? So I might do that and you might even work out the situation and the marriage continue and endure. But it's never really going to be Blot it out. It, it's, it's so dishonorable. It's, it's destructive. There's, there's an irreparable loss of, of trustworthiness. How valuable is that? I sometimes call it credibility, either way. How valuable is that? I have never once, when I used to travel sometimes oh, probably 15 weeks out of a year, I never once worried about what was going on at home. Never. Didn't. Did. I mean, is it worth it? Is it worth it? We've got to determine before we're in a tempting situation to be trustworthy before it. Because the price of a reputation is way too high. It, it, it's extremely high price. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 24. Look how concerned he is about his 
Moses, how concerned he is by his reputation. Hebrews 11, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ear treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Living in the king's castle, he could have enjoyed anything and everything. He wouldn't have it. Considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. It is so costly in ways that people do not, well, in the, in, in the moment, in ways that people do not even consider. The, the other thing that doesn't make sense about it, particularly in our world today, you'll remember, I guess it started in the late 60s, certainly in the 70s, beyond the, the revolution that happened. And what was the presumption if you were free to have relations with anybody that you wanted? What was the presumption of that? It was so liberating. It was so freeing. It's just, hmm, you know, everything was going to be beautiful and free. You could realize your, all the pleasure you wanted, but it's not so. It's not freeing. Look at Proverbs 23, beginning in verse 27. Speaking again to his son, trying to shape his future life. Verse 20, Proverbs 23, verse 27. For a harlot is a deep pit, and an adulterous woman is a narrow well. Surely she lurks as a robber and increases the faithless among men. A deep pit, a narrow well. You're getting ensnared. You're getting trapped in, in a deep, narrow pit that's going to be impossible to escape. Again, you might physically escape. But what happened to your reputation? What happened to your reward? What happened to your spirit? Everything is broken. An extremely high cost. The world, again, contend, you know, still contends that it's liberating. Yet last night I saw another show which alluded to same-sex relationship and they always have to say, not that there's anything wrong with that, they all have to, it's like that's required if you're going to show that. You have to put that phrase in. No. Yep. Yes, sir. You mentioned reputation. It takes a long time to build a good reputation. Yeah, just because in that extremely personal way, now, you can violate people in, in a lot of ways that can be remedied. I mean, if I stole from Jeff, I could pay it back. I could recompense even more. And, and that could be settled. But if I violated my friendship with Jeff with the relationship with his wife, that trustworthiness does not get repaired, does it? It's never really blotted out. That, it, ta it does, it just takes that long to, to destroy a lifetime of a good reputation. And whether it is this matter or in, in so many ways, that's why Solomon is so so keen on setting this standard and practicing this standard before you get in these dangerous situations. In that way, Solomon sees immorality as the most terrible kind of sin because, again, if we go back to Proverbs chapter 5, Proverbs chapter 5 in verses 8 through 11, So many of these, he's prefaced it in verse 7 again, getting his son's attention, 
directly. He says in verse 8, keep your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house, or you will give your vigor to others and your years to the cruel one, and strangers will be filled with your strength, and your hard-earned goods will go to the house of an alien. And you groan at your final end when your flesh and your body are consumed. As he said in other Proverbs, it just doesn't make sense, does it? Is there anything good in it? Nothing. Just doesn't make sense. Immorality will rob them. Most of all, immorality will rob the person of a fulfilling relationship with one mate. And, and possibly lose it all. Proverbs 6 and verse 26. For on account of a harlot, one is reduced to a loaf of bread, and an adulteress hunts for the precious life. She sought him. She got his riches. She reduced him to nothing. It cost him all. Verse 27. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? That's really the gist of all of this, I think. Can you practice this and not be affected? I mean, a lot of people think, I, I, Dina knows who I'll talk about, a guy I used to work with. And he and I traveled some time together, and he said, now, come on, Paul. I know you love your wife. She's at home. You can get out here, and you can do what you want, and you go back home, and you get back in the birdcage. You know, <laughs> no. <laughs> he lived that way. But can a man take fire in his bosom and, and not be burned? That's why Solomon paints this as the most terrible kind of sin, because it deeply changes the inward person. You've broken a covenant with God. You've bankrupted the potential of a good relationship. You've bankrupted your reputation. I mean, what's good in it? Nothing. Ultimately, it's an extremely high cost. Look at verse 32, same chapter. Proverbs 6, verse 32. The one who commits adultery with a woman is lacking sense. He would destroy him. He who would destroy himself does it. Wounds and disgrace he will find, and his reproach will not be blotted out, for jealousy enrages a man, and he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not accept any ransom, nor will he be satisfied, though you give many gifts. That's just what I was talking to you about, hypothetically, Jeff. Is anything going to satisfy you if this situation existed? I can't make up for that. I've harmed you. I've harmed your wife. I've harmed both of your relations. What is not affected by it? That's why Solomon is, is so strong. Yes, sir. I think it's really important that the young people pray for a good life, and they should be looking for a Christian life. All these traps are out there that get in control. Uh, I, I met my wife when she was very young. We were engaged and married when she was very young. Uh, and I praise God for her. Sure not going to do it over. <laughs> sure not going to do it over. I mean, but again, Solomon makes this point. To give yourself to somebody else robs the, the young person of the very best years of our lives. Oh, the young person, what do they think? I'll always be good looking. I'll always be strong. I'll always be desirable. I will, you know, <laughs> sorry, not anymore, dear. <laughs> you know, no, we won't. But... I think we should look seriously, not only personally, but to whatever way we could still influence our children. Probably most of us are talking about influencing our grandchildren. 
the, the church didn't talk enough about this in the previous generation. We need to take a hard look at the sexual ethics that Solomon is, is teaching and apply it really especially to the Christian age that we are to be self-controlled under the rule of Christ and through the strength of Christ be so devoted again as Solomon puts it he puts it as a matter of covenant with God and a covenant with God and with that person we have to consider everything we do in light of the eternal consequences of it. Yeah. Joseph is a marvelous example of somebody that counted the cost. Do I want to pay it now or pay it in eternity? What, look at what all it would have cost him. Look what it would have cost his entire family. Well, look what it would have cost the entire nation of Israel. That reputation. Yes, sir. Presumed positives. Yes, and if something happens, oh, well, we really have nothing bonding us together, and they just go find somebody else. And it's it's so prevalent. Um, people that I've known for years, you know, I see them, and yeah, it just didn't work out with him, but I'm going to move this guy. I'm thinking, what? We've got to remember that the entire relationship is designed and bound by covenant not just the man and wife vows but the covenant of God vow and especially crucial in this Christian age next week we'll begin to consider the controversial topic particularly in this day of training up the child and whether or not to physically discipline the child how much trouble that gets you into in today <laughs> In some places, quite a lot. But we're going to consider that next week.